Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, we begin reading about Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. And this is the man who, of course, met Abraham coming back from the battle in Genesis 14. And if you would just keep your finger in Hebrews 7, because that's where we're going to be. But just flip back to Genesis 14 quickly. The first book in the Bible, the 14th chapter, Genesis 14, where we see Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, where he met Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. And uh, look back at Genesis chapter 14. And of course, Abraham had defeated these five great power, I'm sorry, these four great powerful kings, uh, Keterleomer, Tidal, King of Nations, and these others, when he was delivering his nephew Lot, who had been taken as a prisoner with his family. And uh, the Bible says in verse number 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Keterleomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shady, which is the king's dale. Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now flip back, flip back if you would, to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. So we see Melchizedek introduced in Genesis as the priest of the Most High God. When we get into Hebrews chapter 7, God explains to us that that was actually Jesus Christ who met him returning from the slaughter of the kings of men. Melchizedek was, in fact, Jesus Christ. It says in uh, verse number 7, uh, I'm sorry, verse number 2, chapter 7, it says, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent. It's talking about Melchizedek. He had no father, he had no mother, he had no descent. Having neither beginning of days, so Jesus Christ had no beginning, neither uh, end of life, but made life unto the Son of God, abideth, present tense, abides, still is, he's saying, a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was. He's explaining, look, this is Jesus. He says, consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham, whom you would have thought was the greatest man living at that time, gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises, and watch this, without all contradiction, the less is blessed for the better. So who was greater? Melchizedek or Abraham? Melchizedek was greater, because it was an Old Testament physical uh, bodily appearance of Jesus Christ, the high priest of God. And so it says in verse number uh, 9, And as I may so say, Levi also, who received the tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, what am I preaching on tonight? I'm preaching on the subject, and it's a subject that I rarely preach on, but I do preach on it, it's the subject of tithing. Now, the last time I, I was, I was trying to think of the last time I really preached on this, I think it was back in... January of 2007 is where I came up with, like January 14th. I may have preached on a different time, I don't know, but it's, it seems like it's been a long time that I've preached on this, and I don't preach often on it because it's not something that I really think that much about. I just Money, to me, is, is not an important part of our church. Now, obviously, we do the best we can to be wise about the way that we spend the money and the way that we use the money, and obviously, you know, money makes the world go round, you know, according to the, the people of this world. And we all need money to live and survive and so forth. But when it comes to church, I don't think that God ever intended for money to be something that is emphasized. I don't believe that at all. I mean, it's not emphasized heavily in the Bible. I mean, people will try to say, oh, the Bible talks about money. Some, I heard somebody say one time that one out of five verses in the Bible is about money. You know that's not true. I mean, you read the Bible, you know that's not true. It's a lie, okay? The Bible doesn't emphasize the money, money, money. But it does talk about money. And the Bible talks about everything. And I don't think that uh, money is really at the top of God's list of importance because he paid the streets with gold in heaven. But at the same time, everything's important. And so if God commands this and God talks about this, I ought to preach about it. And I'm going to tell you something. If, if you're not tithing, and maybe another reason why I don't really preach on this that much is because pretty much everybody in our church seems like seems like everybody's tithing. You know, I don't sit down and try to analyze it, but... It just seems like we always have a lot of money coming in. It seems like everybody's tithing. And I, I couldn't even name anybody that, that's not tithing. You know, I don't know. I'm going to name them right now. Right? I, don't know. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. 
I don't know. I don't really care. But what I'm trying to say is, this has never been something that I felt like people struggled with. Or, and, and to be honest with you, it shouldn't be a struggle. I mean, it's not that hard. And let me just preach it to you tonight, what the Bible says about this important subject. Now, of course, we see the first instance of tithing that's actually named and called tithing in the Bible is in Genesis 14, when Abraham tithes to Jesus Christ, uh, also known as Melchizedek. Look at the second instance of tithing in the Bible. It's in Genesis 28, 16. Look at Genesis chapter 28, 16. Now, just so that you know, the word tithe means ten. And God uses those two words interchangeably in Hebrews chapter 7. The Bible is very easy to understand because as you're reading chapter 7 there, you notice in verse number 2 at the beginning it's called ten. And then it says tenth in verse 4. And then it's called the tithe in verse 5. And then it's called the tithe in verse 6. And then it's called tithe in verse 8. Tithe in verse 9. And it goes back to tenth. I mean, back and forth. Tenth, tithe, tithe, tenth. Because God wants you to understand the definition of the word tithe is tenth. So we're talking about ten percent. Now it says in Genesis 28, 16, the Bible reads, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, He had a dream, of course, about the ladder going up to heaven and the angels ascending and descending. And Jacob waked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but, and notice these were the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stones that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which is Hebrew for house. Beth means house. El means God. House of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So this is something that's a concept that's carried throughout the Bible. You know, it's carried throughout Genesis with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then we get into the Mosaic Law. It's reiterated again and again and again. The prophets, the book of Matthew, Hebrews, you know, all throughout the Bible talks about this. Look, if you would, at, at Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. See why this is so important and why I'm taking the time to preach on this tonight. Malachi chapter number 3. And then I'm going to get into some more practical applications of this. But right now I'm just laying the foundation. You know, tithing is something that's found throughout the Bible. It's found throughout the book of Genesis. It's found throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and uh, all the way through the Bible. It says in Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8, it says, Will a man rob God? Are you there in Malachi 3? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Now, where is the tithe supposed to go? To God's house. We saw that in uh, Genesis 28. It said, it's God's house is where I'm going to bring my tithes. Uh, then it says in uh, here, it says, bring the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. So his house is the storehouse for tithing, according to the Bible, which, of course, in the New Testament, his house is the local church. And it says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's a great promise. God is saying, look, I'll take care of you. And Jacob said, hey, as long as God gives me food and clothing, did you see it? If he gives me food to eat and raiment to put on, I will give one-tenth of all that comes to me back to God. If I just have food and clothing. Now, does there, did everybody here eat food today? Did everybody here have clothing on? And you know, God has promised that we would have food and clothing. as He said, in having food and raiment, let us be there with content. God says, does God, does God not clothe? He said, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So God has promised to clothe us. 
He says, Consider the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Hey, fear ye not, therefore. He's saying, Look, I will feed you, I will clothe you. He said, Don't ask yourself, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. And so you will have food and clothing. And, and God says, you have to give me one-tenth of what you have. Because he said, uh, you've robbed me. You say, well, why are we robbing God if we don't give him one-tenth? We're robbing God if we don't give him one-tenth, because the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe of all the land is the Lord's. Look, look at... Uh, Look at, well, I'm trying to go in order here, but I think it's difficult. Look at Proverbs, chapter number 3. Proverbs 3. I've got all kinds of different things here, and I'm trying to go in some semblance of an order here. Look at Proverbs, chapter number 3. You see, we go through life worrying about where the next meal is going to come from. Where are we going to get the clothes we need? How are we going to pay for the house that we need? God has promised to provide for us. He doesn't promise... To give us maybe everything we want in life, but he will give us our needs, which is food and rain. And every single person in this room, God will provide you with food and clothing. And he expects us to give him uh, the tenth part. You say, well, I can't afford the tithe. Well, look, it's a graduated system here. It's 10%. So the less money you have, the less you're even giving. You understand what I'm saying? And the more you have, the more you're giving. And so it's a... Uh, you know, I thank God it's not like the IRS where rich people have to give like 40%. You know, and the poor people are getting money back. You know, they're coming to church and getting a withdrawal. But, uh, you know, it's 10% across the board. And so nobody can really say, well, I can't afford it. You know, different people live at different levels. They live in nicer houses, not so nice, nicer cars, not so... But God just said, look, 10%, wherever you're at on this, if you if you make, you know, uh, $400 a week, it's 40 bucks. If you make, uh, you know, a thousand dollars a week, it's a hundred bucks. You make two thousand bucks a week, it's two hundred bucks. And if you make two thousand bucks a week, you know, you can afford two hundred bucks. If you make four hundred, you can afford to afford. And God has promised. He says, "I will bless you, so that you will have the things that you need and the money that you need." You see, a lot of people they take things into their own hands. They lean upon their own understanding. Okay, look at Proverbs three, and I'm going to explain this. Proverbs three, verse five says, "Trust in the Lord with all thine heart." And lead not unto thine own understanding. That's what we have our own plans, our own ideas of how we're going to make things work. When God has said that he has a method of us giving him 10% and then he will bless us and, and increase us. Look at verse 6. It says, In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Look at the next verse. Honor the Lord with thy substance. And with the first fruits, and first fruits and tithe are used interchangeably. We're going to see that a little later. And with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now listen, why would you want to live your life under a curse from God, where God says, you're cursed with a curse because you've robbed me? Don't you think that God can curse you more than 10% of your income? I do. Think about it. He says here, give him the first fruits of all your increase. Honor it to God, and he will bless you and fill your barns with plenty. But you see, many people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. I'm having financial problems right now, so right now I'm not able to tithe. That's going to make your financial problems worse, because now you're robbing God. Now you're going to go down a downward spiral. I mean, think about it. How many times have you had unexpected things come into your life that cost you a bunch of money? Good night. I mean, do you realize that if one person is room? had some kind of a major illness right now and had to go down to the hospital, that would cost you two years worth of tithing. I mean, think about it. Think about that. I mean, I remember when my wife uh, had her uh, gallstones and she, she had a gallstone with each pregnancy. And she had three kids and three gallstones. Okay? And so she had to have her gallbladder removed. And we didn't have health insurance. And so I just paid for it out of pocket. I just finished paying it off like I think a year ago or something. Yeah, I paid it off for a while, and it was uh, $14,500, just to have a gallbladder. She was just there overnight, that's all. Fourteen, you know, the Q-tips were about $12 per Q-tip. You know, the aspirin was about 15 bucks each. You know how these, these uh, medical staffings are. And so, think about that. I mean, God could just go like this. Wham, 14 grand, gone up in smoke. 
Now, I don't make $140,000 a year. You know, that, even if I were to make hundred and forty grand a year, that would be one year's time. I mean, that's, that's a couple of years of time. Think about that now. I mean, your car, something happens, boom, there's a couple grand right there. You know, there are times that we lose money, and then there's other times we have a windfall where money comes in unexpectedly. Okay, guess who's in charge of these things? God. Am I preaching that you're going to be rich and prosperous and prosperity preaching? No. But don't you think that if God wanted you to have more money, you could, you'd have more money? Or if God wanted you to have less money, he could take away some of your money. God can give you whatever money he wants you to have. And some people are poor and they can't get ahead and they can't get ahead. And they, you know, maybe that's just where God wants you to be in life. And you ought to just, in whatsoever state you are, learn therewith to be content. Maybe God, some, not everybody's made to be rich or even middle class. Sometimes God wants people poor because he knows that's what they can handle. Or he knows that that's when they're going to serve God more. He's trying to teach them a specific lesson or... Some people he wants to have more money than others. But God can give you the money that you need. So to sit there and say, well, i got to step in and do this and take this into my own hands is foolishness. And it shows a lack of faith in what the Bible is saying. Because either this is true or not. And, and what I don't understand is, why go to church if this isn't true? They don't, I mean, if God can't bless you, if God can't provide for you, if God can't feed you, if God can't clothe you, why do you even go to church if you don't believe that God can provide for you? I mean, if God can't provide for it, can God save you? Think about it. If God can't provide for it, can He preserve the Word of God? If He can't even feed you or clothe you or take care of you, but yet we feel the need to take our finances into our own hands? It doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, God said He'd bless us if we do it. He said He'll curse us if we go. So if we really believe that, nobody wants to walk around with a big dark cloud over their head. I'm cursed by God. Think about that. Now, I thank God I was taught to tithe from the time that I can remember. When I was a very small child, I got my first allowance of 30 cents a week. 30 cents. I got a quarter and a, and a nickel. And that was my time. Uh, or that was my allowance per week. And I remember I had, to, I had to get change in order to pay my time. Because I had to change that nickel into five pennies. And I took three pennies. I literally, every week, religiously, never did I miss a week. I put in those three pennies of the offering plate. And that was my tithe. Three pennies, Sunday, after Sunday. Three pennies, three pennies, three pennies. Sometimes, man, it was feeling generous, throwing the whole nickel. <laughs> just, just give it to God. <laughs> and I remember uh, then my allowance went up to 50 cents, two quarters, you know, and I'd have to break it down and get that nickel, throw in my nickel, nickel. I mean, I did this every week, every week, every week. And then I started getting a dollar, and I'd throw in a dime. Get changed, throwing a dime, throwing a dime. And I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I said, I've got a dollar allowance. I pay my tithe a month with 90 cents. You know, I would like to be left over with a dollar when I'm done tithing. And so I told her, I said, I told my mom, I said, I want you to give me a raise to my allowance. I'm not asking for anything big. I said, I want you to give me a raise to a dollar and 11 cents. Because I was smart enough to know that if I got a dollar and 10 cents, now I owe 11 cents tithe. Oh, man, you know, now I'm down to 99 cents. So I said, I want to have a full dollar, a dollar bill. And so I said, I want a dollar and 11 cents. Come on. And she said, no, no, you can't do it. Because she said, she said, if I do that, it's defeating the purpose of teaching you to tithe. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to teach you to tithe. I'm not just going to give you, like, well, here's your allowance, but here's the tithe on top. And I'll help you out with that. She said, one day you're not going to be able to go to your boss and say, can I have a raise of 11 cents per hour? Because <laughs> I'm trying to tie it on it. Okay. And so, I, but I thank God that they taught me that. Because I, I literally, okay, I literally, from the time I was born until now, I mean, I've tied every week. If there was a time I didn't tie, it was, it was a, maybe an oversight or something that I didn't realize. But I mean, as far as I know, I've tied my entire life. I mean, it's just something, it's just a part of who I am. Just tie, tie, throw it in. Now, when I was growing up, I, had, I was taught some things that were incorrect about tithing. Like, my parents taught me this. They said, don't ever tithe on a gift. You know, they said, only, you only tithe on, like, wages that you earn. So when people would give me things, I never tithe on it. But the Bible says, you know, tithe on all your increase. So I believe that every time you increase, you should tithe on it. And so, you know, in the early days, I wasn't tithing on the increase. I, did, I just tithe only on wages, my allowance. And then also, when I got a job, I started working at Round Table Pizza. I worked there for three years. And I would, I would tithe after taxes. You know, because that's, that's what, again, that's what I was taught to do. I just tithe after taxes. 
And, you know, Uncle Sam took out his big chunk. And then I got a tax return. I tithe on that. But then I got in church and the, the pastor preaching and said, in all things, he must have the preeminence. Right. So I don't want to give, like, the IRS their piece of the action and then give God his piece of the action. So then I start tithing before taxes. And that's what I do now. I tithe before taxes. And then, and then you know, I got to a point where I realized I started working for a job where uh, they were paying me for my meals and they were paying for, you know, all these benefits and stuff. And so I began to tithe on anything that came my way. Whatever came to me, whatever I increased, I did tithe on. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of things that I think people tithe on that are not necessarily to be tithed on. You say, oh man, you're just trying to get every ounce and just squeeze people for money. I don't care about the money. Is this something I preach about a lot, Amanda, who's been here since the second Sunday? This is like, she's, she's shocked that I didn't preach yet. You know, it's just it's like, oh man, do I walk in the wrong church? You know, I don't preach on this all the time. And I'm not trying to squeeze all the money because there are people in this church who can tell you. They come to me and said, here's my tithe on such and such. And I told them, I said, wait a minute. That's not something you tithe on. And I said, you know, if you want to give an offering, great. But I said, I wouldn't tithe on that. I don't believe that you need. For example, if somebody, uh, you know, is paying for, uh, you know, people pay into insurance plans, for example. Like, like Social Security. You know, people pay into Social Security their whole life. They pay into it, they pay into it, pay into it. And then finally at the end of their life, they start paying them back, paying them back. That's not an increase. Let me just break this to you. The government spent all your money. All that retirement money? I mean, if you had all the money that you've been paying into that thing, you'd be on the beach in Maui right now, okay? If you're also, I mean, you'd be, you'd have a palm tree and lemonade and a lounge chair, and you would be in a million dollar mansion with all the money. Paying 15, I mean, look, if you save up 15.3% of your income every week, whew, you will retire a millionaire. But when Uncle Sam takes 15.3%, they're so good at managing your money. They're such a great financial planner that at the end of it all, you get like 800 bucks a month or whatever, 600 bucks a month. Yes. You know, when really you should get like 6,000 bucks a month or 60,000 bucks a month. I mean, the amount that you pay in. Seriously. Does anybody know any math at all? Obviously not because they keep voting these same idiots in and you're probably going to go down and vote for one of these idiots too. Uh, and unless, you to, unless you, you know, one of these idiots that the, you know, the, the TV will tell you, oh yeah, you got to vote for this one or this one. You know, they're both idiots. Right. I can vote for either one of them. They both want to take 15% of my money every time. Oh man. God only asked for 10%. And that, that's just the Social Security 15.3%. Let alone all the federal tax, the state tax, the, 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 the local tax. And you know, they think they're God. God wants 10%. They want 40%. What does that make them? If God wants 10%, they want more than God. Amazing. But the thing is, what was I talking about? Uh, you, tithing, you know, tithing on Social Security, you know, if you want to do that as an offering, hey, praise the Lord. But what I'm saying is, I don't believe that you have to tithe on something where you paid into it, you got less back. Like, for example, if you buy a car for $5,000, then you sell that car later for $3,000, that's not an increase. You you lost two thousand bucks. Okay. Let's say you. Yeah, why are you laughing? I mean, this is too simple. If you buy a car for five thousand bucks, then you turn around and sell it for ten thousand bucks. Is that an increase? You increase by five grand. You tithe on that. Okay. Uh, some people tack, tithe on their tax return or on their tax rebate check. I didn't tithe on my rebate. I'll tell you right now. I got my tax rebate of how much? How much did they send us? Who knows how much that was. How much was it per kid? 600. 600 for a married couple and then 300 per kid or something? I don't know. I, I got like 1200 bucks or 1800 bucks. What was it? 2400 bucks! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, 20. Wow. But you know what was amazing about it this year? I had just written them a check for like 7500 bucks a month before my check came. So I wrote them 7500 bucks. And then they said, here's 2400 to buy your vote this November. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that was really an increase. No. How is that an increase? I, they stole 7500 and they gave me 2400 back. That's not an increase. Does everybody understand this? So did I tithe on that? No. Okay. Uh, when it, uh, other things, sometimes people will, uh, they pay into a health insurance plan. Every, every month they're paying in, paying in, paying in. Then they get sick and they... The health insurance pays their bill. They don't have to tithe on that. I mean, you know, they paid for that service. Same thing with auto insurance. They paid to fix your car. Well, you paid for the insurance every month. 
And so that you're not, that's not an increase because you paid in more than you pulled out. Does that make sense? But if you pay in and then pull out more than you paid in, you know, uh, then that's something that you would tithe on. Okay? It's you tithe on your increases, not just every time necessarily money exchanges hands. So every time you go to work and you work and you get your paycheck, that's an increase. That's money that's coming to you that you didn't have before, and so you tithe. Does that make sense to everybody? And so, you know, if anybody ever has a question about that, you know, you ask me, I'd be glad to ask, answer it. But, you know, I'm not just after just money, 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 money. Because people come to me and, and had a tithe on something. I've, I've come to them and said, and they can tell you about all kinds of different people. And I told them, I said, you know what, let me just explain this to you scripturally. And you make your own decision, but this is the way I believe, just so that you can be informed. Now, let me use an illustration. You say, why did God institute tithing? Well, let me give you part of the reason. Think about this now. Let's say, because of course you're supposed to tithe at the house of God, and the Bible says to bring the tithe to the storehouse. Did it say to mail the tithe to the storehouse? <laughs> Send it to the storehouse. No, he said to bring it. So in order to bring the tithe, you have to come to church, all right? So if you don't come to church, you're not tithing, right? You're not scripturally tithing because you're not bringing it. <laughs> now, let me use an illustration for you. Let's say you wanted to give me money. I mean, I'm not talking about this church. You just wanted to give me money, okay? And so, uh, let's say you said, I'm going to deposit some money into Stephen Anderson's bank account. Well, look, you have to go to Wells Fargo because that's where I bank. And by the way, this message is sponsored in part by Wells Fargo. But if you wanted to deposit money into the account of Stephen L. Anderson, you got to go to Wells Fargo, okay? Now, what happens if you brought money down to Capital... Or, what's this one that you go to? Chase... Let's say you brought the money down to Chase and said, I want to deposit this in the account of Stephen Anderson. Or let's say I took my paycheck and said, I want to put this in my bank account. You're never going to get any money to me by giving it to Chase Bank. You're not going to be able to deposit money into my account by going to Bank of America. You're not going to be able to deposit money into my account by going to this uh, school's credit union, Desert School's credit union. You must go to my bank in order to deposit money in my account. And let me tell you something. If you think that God has an account at these liberal churches, these, these churches that are using a different Bible, preaching a different salvation, okay, uh, they're not the house. It's, remember the sermon about where the colonel came down? Remember that sermon? I mean, if the colonel has come down, God has already moved his account from that bank. And so you go to some messed up church, drop your money, and play, are you really tithing in God's house? You're putting, in some, you're putting in the wrong account. You put your money in one of these uh, uh, apostate churches, you're not tithing to God. You're putting in the wrong account. And so part of the way of tithing right is you have to go to a church that truly is God's house. And that's where you put the tithing. Now you've made a deposit into God's account. And so that's part of the reason why you should tithe. But here's another reason why you should tithe. Because it causes you to be thankful. Because in order to give 10% of all your increase, and this is why it was a great day when I realized that I should be tithing on all my increase, not just my paycheck, because it causes me every week to sit down and take an inventory of everything I've received the whole week. And when you really sit down and think about it, you said, oh man, you know, I got this, somebody gave me this, and, and somebody uh, paid for my meal, and somebody did this for me, and I got a check in the mail for this, and... Somebody gave you this, and then there's my paycheck, and this and that. It causes you to take an inventory, and sometimes when you sit down and count it up, you got more in the week than you previously thought until you sat down and thought about it. And so that's why it's good that it's a percentage, because it causes us to sit down and count our blessings and be thankful for everything that's come in. And we can part show that gratitude by saying, look, all things come from thee, God. You know, everything came from you. And so I can say thank you to God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow turning. I can say thank you, God, for everything that you blessed me with this week. Now I'm going to, in gratitude, give the tenth part back to you. I'll bring it down to the bank, your bank account, down to Faithful Word Baptist Church or another scriptural church that's a King James Bible preaching soul winning type Baptist church. You know? I'll make the deposit. I'll, I'll give it to God. Give him, tenth. give him the tenth. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 12. And we'll see this illustrated even more about, you know, making sure that you're putting your deposit in the right account. I mean, would you, wouldn't, wouldn't it be embarrassing if you called me up and said, Hey, Pastor Anderson, I got great news. I just deposited a thousand dollars into your account. Really? Great. Really? How'd you know what bank I banked at? Well, I figured you banked at Chase. 
So I went down there and I asked, uh, do you have anybody here that has an account named by the name of Steven Anderson? And they said, sure we do. Well, go ahead and put this thousand dollars in his account. And I say, and I, listen, my friend, I, I hate to tell you this, but Steven Anderson's a pretty common name. Have you ever noticed how much I use my have you ever noticed how much I use my middle initial? Steven L. Anderson? And even that's a common name. And uh, I'm sure that somebody's pretty happy right now that you gave him a thousand bucks, but it wasn't me. You feel a little bit stupid. I'd be a little upset, you know. <laughs> I mean, I graduated with several Steven Andersons in my high school. I have met somebody named Steven Anderson who was born on July 24th. I went down to get a background check in Phoenix. There was a Steven Anderson born on July 24th that's got a criminal record. You know, but he's like 20 years older than me. But that, that could be getting messed up sometime. You know, people are digging up dirt on Steven Anderson, you know. But... You know, I went down there because I had to get a, a contractor's license, and I did the background check, and there was this other Steven Anderson, and, you know, they bring out this big thing, you know, this is your record. I'm like, no, that's not mine, you know. <laughs> mine should be just like a thin piece of paper, just with a lot of traffic violations on it, you know. It shouldn't have any kind of felonies or anything on it, you know. Nothing crazy like that. But, you know, that's all beside the point. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, and I want to show you another important thing about uh, tithing. It says in verse number 1, it says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, whither the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and under the hills, I mean, upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. He shall not be so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Notice that phrase. Out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes, and heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your free will offerings, and the first things of your herds, and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. So he's saying here to bring your tithe, and he talks about the burnt sacrifices, which of course were fulfilled with Jesus Christ, and those no longer pertain to us. But he says, bring the tithe to the place that God shall choose. Not attend the church of your choice this Sunday. Attend the church of God's choice. Right. God will choose which place he'll put his name. And it's not a particular place, but it's any place that meets the criteria in the scripture of what a, a church is and what, a, what a, a spiritual, actual house of God really is. And so it's got to be the place that God chooses or else you're putting your tithe in the wrong place. You're not even really tithing. Now, look if you would at... at uh, Let's see here. Deuteronomy, we're in chapter 12, look at chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14, 22, the Bible reads, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that, that the field bringeth forth year by year. It says, And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. That's why we always have food after church. We're like the most scriptural church around. In the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the first things of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household, and the Levite that is within thy gates. Thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithes of thy increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part, nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat, and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. So God's saying, I'll bless you if you'll tithe on your increase. And he says, this is what you do. The tithe, back then, a lot of what they did was barter. It wasn't a lot to do with, with cash or money. 
You say, why is it that we do everything with money today? We don't really, uh, we don't really do everything with cash. Well, obviously it's more convenient just to use cash, but another reason is the government just wants to get a piece of the action. And when you trade things, the government doesn't even know about it. That's why people who live in Europe, you know what they do to avoid the government? They'll do all kinds of stuff like, you know, you give me a pig and I butcher it and then we'll pass it off to this person and let's trade the meat for something that was grown in the field. They try to do as much as they can and barter because the government has such high taxes, you know. And uh, when you have a system where everything's all based on money, the government can easily tax everything. And so back then a lot of it was barter. And so what they would do is when they would tithe, I mean, they would, if they had 10 cows, they would bring one cow to Kant's house. And that was their time, okay? Or if they had, uh, you know, 10 ephahs of flour, you know, they bring one down to the house of God. And they would literally bring one-tenth of what they received and what they increased down to the house of God. Because the priest, he didn't have any inheritance with it. He had no land. He had no job. His only job was to work about the house of God and do the sacrifices and to do the work of the house of God. And so they lived off of the tithe. Okay? The priests, they would live off of the fact that these people would bring in all their cattle and their food and everything and tithe it, and then that's what they would live off. And they also lived off the burnt sacrifices. They would eat a, a certain portion of the meat that went in that. So he says here, if, if the place is too far away, you know, and you don't want to bring this cow just hundreds of miles, you're bringing cows and food and all this, you got this big entourage and stuff, because some of these people like tithing once a year or once every three years or whatever, they would store it up and then bring it down and give it all at the house of God, which was in Jerusalem eventually, before that it was in a few other places, but at the place God would choose always, and so they didn't, if you lived really far from Jerusalem, this would be quite an ordeal, bringing all this stuff, so he says you can turn it into money. Bring the dollar equivalent of what you're tithing and just give that. And that's, it'll be accepted. Or he said, when you get there, you can buy food and buy whatever it was that you wanted to give. And, and he says, you know, you could eat some of it too. You know, you participated too. Because they basically, if you notice, they all brought it and then they all bought a bunch of food and they all ate it. And they did. And they, but they didn't just eat it themselves. They ate it with the fatherless, the widow, the poor. And the Levite, because he didn't have any income, he lived off of the, you know, the money from the house of God. Hey, you know, godliness was his means of gain. But, uh, you know, somebody needs to tell that to the editors of the New King James Version, uh, if you didn't hear the sermon this morning. And so, the point is that, that's why, it, let's say somebody gives you something. Let's say somebody gives you a cow. You know, that's never happened. But let's say somebody gives you a car, right? And somebody hands you the keys to a car that's worth $20,000. Okay, obviously you're not going to, you know, take the wheels off, take off, you know, the muffler and stuff and say, here's one-tenth of this car, you know, I'm going to give one-tenth to God. Obviously you turn it into money, right? So if it's a $20,000 car, you just give $2,000. Oh man, I don't know if I can afford that. Look man, somebody's going to give you a $20,000 car. You're doing pretty good, you know? <laughs> you, you can cough up the 2000 bucks, you know, and that's what God expects you to. God didn't. Uh, I remember one. I remember when we first got married. I could hardly afford to tithe on everything people were giving us because people were giving us and giving us. And I was thinking, like, people need to stop giving us stuff because I don't have the money to tithe on all this stuff. You know, these people gave me like eight hundred dollars worth of stuff. I didn't even have eighty bucks hardly. But you know what? I scraped it together and coughed up the eighty bucks and paid my tithe because you know I turned it into money. And and you know what? I, I can say is God has blessed me over the years. And boy, we, man, when we were first married, it was very lean. Very lean. And I mean, we were starving. I mean, it was, it was, we were very poor. But you know what? God has blessed me through the years. And I believe that part of that is just tithing. You know what I mean? Just, just God is taking care of it because he's seen somebody with a heart that wasn't just trying to just grasp it all and keep it all. And you know, you can sit there and say, well... I'm not trying to be grasping, I'm just trying to survive. Nobody in this room is just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Alright? I mean, if we, we in America, we live good. Come on. Every single meal we eat is a balanced meal, unless it's by our own, you know, choice to go to Little Caesars or whatever, you know. Uh, it's, it, unless it's by our own, our own choice to go to some place that's not nutritional value. You know, I'm not preaching anybody in particular. But the, the point is, we can eat a balanced diet, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We've got clean water. We've got a nice place to live. God didn't even promise to give you a place to live. Did you notice that? He just promised food and clothing. 
He never even promised that you have a house, okay? But most people here have a, a house or a nice apartment or something. And so God's blessed us great. None of us is just surviving. And we just, I mean, if we tithe, it'll be the last food out of our child's mouth. I mean, it's either feed the baby or tithe. Nobody's living like that. You know, and, and to pretend to is to call God a liar because God said he'd feed you anyway. And do you remember when Elisha, I'm sorry, Elijah, came to the, to the widow woman as Zarephath? And God had commanded her to sustain Elijah. And he came and uh, he said, give me a cruise of water. And she said, okay, I'll get you a cup of water. And he said, oh, by the way, give me a little cake to eat too. I'm hungry. And she said, well, you know what? I don't have a cake. She said, all I have is just a little bit of meal in the bottom of the barrel. And I've got two sticks. And I'm going to take these two sticks. I'm going to make a little fire. And I'm going to cook on the coals this little bit of meal and make like a pancake. Okay, a little, just a little tiny cake. And I'm going to split it with my son and we're both going to eat it and then we're going to die. And he says, well, just go ahead and make it for me anyway. <laughs> That's what he said. He's just like, okay, um, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, can, you, can you hurry up with that? <laughs> go ahead and read the story. It's in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. And so, uh, you know, she goes in and she, she basically cooks it up and gives it to him. And he says, by the way, if you give it to me, it's never going to run out until the famine's over. And you and your son will keep eating it and eating it and living. Now think about how stupid it would have been if that woman was said, no, I'm not giving it to you. I don't care what God said. I'm just going to eat this. My, me and my son are going to eat this. And it's all we got and we're going to die. You know what she would have done? She would have cooked it, split it out, eaten it, and died. Right? But when she gave it to Elijah, then it just kept coming. And for months, they would just they would open the, the barrel and there's just a little bit left. Just a little bit left. There's always a little bit left, you know, it seems like. I mean, you know, as lean as you get financially, right? I mean, God sometimes brings us pretty lean. There's always a little bit left. Remember the feeding of 5,000? I mean, Jesus took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And we don't think that God can multiply our sustenance and provide our needs that we have to take it into our own hands and lean on our own understanding and do it our way and say, no God, you cannot have this cake. I will eat it myself and you'll eat it all right and it'll be the last thing you ever eat from God. You know, I mean, that'd be terrible if that one would. That would have been a sad story. And you know what you'd say if you read that story and that's how it was? you say, man, God, why was God so hard on that one? All she had to do was just what God told her to do and everything would have been great. And that's just kind of how it is with God. You just have to do things his way. And he just demands everybody to do it his way. Because, you know, say, well, I, well what gives him the right? Because he's God? Because he created the whole world? Well, I don't know, you know, what gives him the right to run everybody's life? He's God. He created you. He could, he could end your life right now. He controls the whole world. Okay, this is God we're talking about. And if he says, give me one tenth, just give him a tenth. If you know what's good for you, just do it. And, and then, you know, you say, oh, and then God's just immediately going to bless me? You know, he'll take care of you. You'll never run out. I'm not saying, I don't think that that woman was necessarily eating, you know, a seven-course meal. I mean, she was pretty much just eating cakes, and that's about it. But that's better than starving death. That's better than, uh, you know, that uh, dying slowly of hunger. She, she lived. A lot of other people died in that family, if you read the Bible. But she lived. She stayed through the whole thing because she listened to God and obeyed God. And so you turn it into money. You bring it under the house of God. You know, you eat it with us. You know, sometimes you get a piece of it back when you eat with us. And we have meals and programs. And, you know, that's why I think it's, it's another reason why it's sinful to sell the food at church. You know what I mean? Because they sit there and, you know, churches just sell everything these days. You know, they're selling the CDs, they're selling books, they got the bookstore and the book table and the CD books and, and the and this bookstore and the, the order form. And then and then they finally have a meal. And you're like, oh, great, you know, we can have a little pot, you know, meal. It's a pot, you know, everybody brings it. And then you pay five bucks. It's like, everybody brought this food. I mean, I'm going to do a potluck where you pay. You're, you're paying to eat the food that you brought, you know? <laughs> Who's been to a potluck where you paid? Oh, yeah. And then, and then other times, they'll provide the food and you pay. But where did they get the money to provide the food? Out of their own pockets? No. They took it from what? The tithes. Okay, great. No problem. That's very scriptural to take the tithe money, buy food with it. 
But guess what? Then everybody just ate it. And guess who else ate it? The fatherless. Because he wasn't charged five bucks at the door. Because the fatherless doesn't have any money. The widow doesn't have any money. You say fatherless, that was back then. Okay, have you ever, have you ever driven into South Phoenix? You want to talk about the fatherless? <laughs> Those people are fatherless down there. 